Welcome to Millsaps College. I'm Rob Perigen. It's my privilege to serve as president of Millsaps and to introduce our program this afternoon. As some of you know, this isn't uh, Senator Kennedy's first time to campus. His son, Preston, is a student here. And so we have enjoyed the relationship with the Kennedy family over the last few years and delighted to have um, his wife and son with us today. But this is the first time we've had an opportunity to convene a public forum for Senator Kennedy to share his reflections on public service and on the national political scene. So we're extremely grateful to you, Senator Kennedy, for, for being with us today. In addition to Senator Kennedy, I'd like to thank two anonymous donors in the audience today who felt so inspired by a public forum we hosted a few years ago that they created an endowment to support the Elise and William Winter Speaker Series here at Millsaps. We at Millsaps believe that we have an opportunity and indeed a responsibility to bring important topics and speakers to the public's attention, to be a public square of sorts. And we're especially pleased and honored to have our name linked with Elise and William Winter through this endowment. So thank you to our friends. Governor, Mid Governor and Mrs. Winter couldn't be with us today, but they send their greetings. During a time when our elected leaders often feel very remote, Senator Kennedy has been remarkably effective communicating to the public in an accessible, folksy manner that is as entertaining as it is informative and important. Have you heard, for example, anyone else call Senator John McCain tough as a boiled owl? Or who else can you imagine referring to the recent omnibus spending bill as, quote, a great Dane-sized whiz down the leg of every taxpayer. <laughs> the, the man has a way with words. So. Beyond the wit, though, lies a remarkable intelligence and an abiding commitment to looking out for his state and our nation. Perhaps that dedication has been most prominently on display during his tough but fair questioning of judicial nominees appearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee, including one particularly awkward exchange, for the candidate that is, that went viral last December. Before being elected to the Senate in 2016, Mr. Kennedy was state treasurer for Louisiana, and prior to his position as treasurer, he served as secretary of the Department of Revenue and special counsel to Governor Romer and secretary of Governor Romer's cabinet. He was also an attorney and partner in the Baton Rouge and New Orleans fir law firm of Chape McCall. Mr. Kennedy is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Vanderbilt University and received his law degree from the University of Virginia before graduating with first class honors in one of the most notoriously difficult degrees at Oxford University, the BCL. He resides in Madisonville, Louisiana with his wife Becky and their son Preston and their founding members of the North Cross United Methodist Church. So please join me in welcoming U.S. Senator John Kennedy. What an honor it is to be here with you uh, this afternoon. I I'm joined by my wife, Becky. Raise your hand, Beck. And... Uh, Becky is, uh, has a great deal of patience. Every, every, uh, every time I come in from Washington, uh, I think, gosh, I hope she hadn't changed the locks this time. Uh, but she's been very patient because the job I have, and I've been in and out of politics for a while, it's pretty demanding. Also with me today is my son, Preston, about whom I'm gonna speak in a moment. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm especially honored to have an old friend of mine with whom I went to college, Ms. Susan Shans, who is an honors graduate of Vanderbilt University, both undergraduate and its law school. Uh, she handles the legal matters for our medical center. Um, and I, I, uh, it's just such an extra treat today for me get to, see, to get to see Susan. I am honored. And I would, I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, I know you know this, but how fortunate you are. What an extraordinary school. 
You know, wh whether you're talking about humanities or sciences or the social sciences or business, Millsaps ranks right at the top. Uh, and, and, and that's not easy. Uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the higher education system in America is the best in the world. Now, we have problems in our country with elementary and secondary education, but we don't with higher education. Uh, young people from all over the world want to come to America to go to college, and they've got many fine universities and colleges to choose from. But not a single one of them is better than Millsaps. Um, you know, you can count on one hand and a couple of fingers, and this is not the only barometer, but it's a telling one. You can count on one hand and a couple of fingers how many colleges and universities in America have had not one, but two Rhodes Scholars in the last three years. And you're going to see the usual suspects on that list. You'll see Harvard and uh, the military academies. You'll see Duke. But you're going to see another name called Millsap College. Now, that's not the only barometer of excellence in a university. But it's not chopped liver either. And, uh, and I also noticed, uh, I think I saw it on, on uh, I don't remember where I saw it, but I think Mills, uh, Millsap just had a, has a, a new Fulbright scholar as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, so honored to, uh, to be here for that reason as well. Um, my son is, a, is going to graduate soon. He came to Millsaps as a boy. He's leaving as a man. Um, I'm very proud of him. He, uh, he's made his grades, and he's got no visible tattoos. <laughs> so dad, dad's very happy. I named Preston. I'm going to hush in a minute, son. You know, I, I named Preston, Becky and I named Preston. He's our one and only after my late father. His name was Preston, too. This will not mean much to some of you. The younger you are, the less this will mean to you. But my father always told me, he would say, son, you will never understand love until you have a child. It's not like the love for a spouse uh, or the love for, for a parent or the love for a sibling or the love for a friend. It's, it's unique. And I used to say, ah, dad, you know, what do you know? Well, he knew a lot. You will never understand love. Until you, until you have a child. And I remember uh, that was brought home, that and the significance of parenthood. One night, Preston doesn't remember this, but he was about four years old. We live in Madisonville, a little town on the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain. It was uh, storming, lots of rain, lightning. Friday night, it must have been about midnight. Becky and I are in bed, and uh, Preston, about four years old, comes in the room, wakes me up. Becky's still asleep. He said, Dad, can I get in bed with y'all? I said, sure, absolutely. And he got in bed between Becky and me, and a few minutes went by, and he leaned over. I'll never forget. He said, Dad, I love you. Well, your heart just melts. I said, this is what it's about. And then a few minutes went by, and he leaned back over, and he said, Dad. I said, yes, son. He said, Dad, I just peed. <laughs> So that's, that, that, that's parenthood. <laughs> Let me talk a second about the Senate and a few issues in front of us. And then I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave as much time as I can for questions. I've been in the United States Senate for uh, 14, 15 months now. Um, you learn a lot very quickly, you have to. We were together a great deal, both in committees and on the floor of the Senate, and I've gotten to know every one of my colleagues. There are a couple of jerks, as you would expect, but not as many as you would expect. There's some big egos. There are a few of our, our, our colleagues that think they're one of the founding fathers. Um, but for the most part, almost exclusively, it's 100 men and women whip smart, who want what's best for their and our country. 
We just disagree sometimes over what that is. Reasonable people often disagree over solutions to, uh, to difficult problems. But I have never once doubted the, uh, the commitment of any of my colleagues, and every day that I am there, I am impressed. Every single day. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a very humbling experience. When, when you walk the halls of the Congress, um, you, you're, you're, you're taking steps in a place that, uh, that, that, that uh, gave birth to leaders in this country like Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, uh, Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, and of course I could, could go on and on. Um, it's a little like drinking from a fire hose, but I can't imagine any better place in the world if you, if you care about policy than the United States Senate. Uh, on a, any given day, you will see issues like uh, the chronic disease management program for Medicaid in the state of Florida, and whether it's working or not. You, you'll, you'll talk about and have to, to debate and you'll learn a lot about the, the conflict in Syria and the potential for a war between Iran and, uh, and Israel, which we can talk about if you'd like. Uh, it, it, it is there's just no, no better place if you, if you uh, care about public policy. It can be frustrating. The Senate is different from the House. In the House, majority rules. If you've got the votes, you can do it. And the House is run by the Speaker and his or her most senior lieutenants. Um, to, to, uh, to get a bill even considered on the floor of the House, you have to go through what's called the Rules Committee. You have to actually go to the Rules Committee and say, I have this bill and I want the House to consider it. The Rules Committee, of course, is controlled by the Speaker of the House. And the Rules Committee says, okay, well, you can't bring your bill. And you can't bring your bill. Or, they, or, or it might say you can bring your bill, but you can only accept three amendments. So it's, it's, it's very much, it's called the people's house in the sense that it's a majority rules. The Senate is different. I won't bore you with how, but one, sen one senator, one single senator can shut the whole place down. I could walk in Monday morning, say, show me the list of pending bills, and I could... could tell my uh, staff, call the majority leader's office and tell them I want to hold on this bill, this bill, and this bill, and this nomination. And because of the filibuster rule and the, the amount of time it takes to break a filibuster, Senate would shut down. Now, this is obviously not a power that most senators use every day, but it is there. And it forces the Senate because of the unlimited debate and the need for the cloture rule, it forces the Senate to listen to what others say. It forces the Senate to compromise. Sometimes that fr that's frustrating. When you want to gallop, when you want to make great progress in a short period of time, it can be frustrating. You have to understand that instead of galloping on most days, you just kind of inch along. But unless you think, and I've never met anybody who did, unless you think you have a monopoly on the right thing to do in every instance, it forces you to listen to other people. It forces you to test your assumptions against the arguments of people who disagree with you. And I think, uh, I think our founders... Uh, I got in trouble one time for saying, but it was true, that our country was founded by geniuses, but on some days, I think it's being run by idiots. I probably ought to take the idiot part back, but the founders, I meant it. They, they were absolutely geniuses in, in, in uh, designing a government. Let me just hit a lick on a couple of the issues that we're facing. Um, you know, the great thing about America is that the circumstances of your birth don't have to determine the outcome of your life. I mean, that's what the American dream is all about. It's about hope. 
But it's hard to improve the outcome of your life if you don't have a decent job. We, we, we went through a very rough patch, starting with the, the Great Recession of 2008. Um, and and a, lot of, a lot of people didn't think we'd come out of it. I'm happy to tell you we're out of it. Um, in the last year and a half, we have created 3 million new jobs in our country. I didn't. Business women and businessmen did. Uh, but before 19, 2008, if you went back 30 years, the average growth in the American economy was 3.1%. 3 percent's average. Uh, we had not had 3% growth uh, on an annualized basis until this year. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for it. I think, uh, I think one of them has to do with our tax legislation. Uh, some of you may disagree with this, and that's okay. As I said earlier, reasonable people disagree. But it's been my experience in government and in, and in life that people can spend the money they earn, all things being equal, better than government can. There's some things government does better. But for the most part, if you believe in the free enterprise system, and I do, you believe that people can spend the money they earn better than government can. And with the tax cut bill, we, I think we will, we, we will have cut taxes for just about every American, including and especially the middle class. We will have cut taxes for every business. Uh, if we can add four-tenths of 1% growth to GDP over a 10-year period, the tax cut bill will pay for itself. It, it, it will uh, not contribute to our deficit. And thus far, we're seeing, uh, we're, we're seeing the, the, the good results as a, as a, as a, as a result. Um, the other advantage we have today, and you're picking a, a good time to be in college and, and an even better time to graduate, the world economy is doing much better. Um, Europe. I, I was just in London and Brussels. Europe is, uh, is growing again. Uh, it still has some financial problems. The banks in Italy are still a mess. Uh, the, the, our friends in Greece still spend more money than they take in, but for the most part, the European economy is growing, and that's going to help our world. Uh, the, the, the Chinese economy has not crashed. Many experts said it would. It's growing about 6.8% a year. India is doing great, growing about 8%. Brazil's back on its feet. Mexico's doing fine. Canada's doing fine. Um, and, and I think, I think the, the economic anxiety was the genesis of, of, of a lot of the anger in America. It's not the only reason, but it's some of it. Let me just mention one other subject, um, and, and then uh, I'll talk. Let me just mention something about higher ed, and then I don't want to go on too long. I want to leave time for questions, plenty of time for questions. I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. America has the best system of higher education in all of human history. Period. I'm not saying there aren't some fine universities in other countries. But students from all over the world want to come to America. And we should celebrate that fact every single day. Our challenge in higher education, actually there are a couple of them. The first is financial. It costs a lot of money to run this place. And if you look at the tuition in America, since 1985, it's gone up more than 500 percent. That's more than uh, health care. That's more than the price of a home. Now, I know our president works on that every single day, but it's something we've got to be mindful of in America, that we not make an education beyond the reach of the average middle or lower income American. Because in some cases, um, I taught for 15 years at the uh, law school at LSU. This is the first year I haven't taught. And I remember talking to many of my students thinking, well, they're graduating with a degree in law, but they're also graduating with a degree in debt. And uh, we, we have to face that problem squarely in America so that we do not cut off access 
uh, to, to our fine colleges and universities. This, the second challenge, and I think Millsaps has, done a, a, has met this challenge and more, but in some, in some respects, um, higher education, post-elementary and secondary education, has not kept up with technology. You know, in, in, in my generation, uh, you went to college, got a degree, so at the beginning of your career, you had, a, you had a burst at the beginning. And then you went to work for a company. You stayed with that company for a long time, uh, maybe moved around a little bit, and you got additional training fr from your company. Those days are gone, folks. They're gone. Education now is about lifelong learning. There's, there are answers to how to do that. Um, I'm a big believer in, in the MOOCs, the massive open online internet courses. Um, but it's also an attitude that, okay, I, I got my degree from Millsaps and I never have to read another book. Now, that doesn't happen with many Millsaps students, but it happens more than you think in, uh, uh, among college graduates. It's a lifelong process. And, and we've got to figure out a way to harness technology to make that lifelong process of learning affordable and accessible. The third thing I'll mention, which is controversial, I think it's a challenge to our universities today. The purpose of a college or a university is not vocational. It's not. I'm not saying vocational training isn't important, but uh, I don't know what the, uh, the employment rate for English majors is in America. I don't. Probably pretty low, at least in the field of English. But I would fight like hell if somebody tried to eliminate departments of education, for example, or the humanities from our universities. Education is about helping you understand how to live a life of meaning and purpose. It's to teach you how to think. And that ultimately is the purpose of a, of a college or a university, is to teach you how to think. It's not to make you comfortable. And there's a movement on some campuses today, a huge th mistake, I think, for higher education and for America, to... Uh, to shelter students from certain ideas or thoughts, usually ideas or thoughts from speakers they disagree with. I'm not talking about speakers who come and incite you to violence. I'm not talking about a speaker who would come here and say, when you graduate, make sure you move to, uh, to Myanmar and you, you, you work with the government there and help them commit genocide on the Rohingya Muslims. I'm not, that, that kind of speech has no place under the First Amendment in our colleges and universities elsewhere. But just because you don't agree with a speaker, just because a speaker might make you angry, it doesn't mean that speaker should be excluded. And, and I see this happening more and more and more in America. And it's a dangerous trend. I debate every day in committee and on the floor of Senate with colleagues with whom I disagree, sometimes uh, sharply, sometimes vociferously. But uh, you will never hear me attack another senator personally. Not because it's a club, though it is kind of clubby, but it's not because it's a club. It's because these are people that are well-intentioned, and even if they weren't, I don't have a monopoly on truth. And um, I've changed my mind plenty of times. And it's usually after testing my assumptions against the arguments of others. So thanks again for having me. Um, you know, we, 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 we live in cynical times. I know that. And there's a lot of anger in our country. You, you've probably heard people use this expression. I might have used it myself. You know, there are no more heroes in America today. But there are, and you really don't have to look far to see them. You can walk down 
any uh, street, any main street of any town or hamlet or city in Mississippi or Vermont or Louisiana or California, and you're going to see heroes. You're going to see women who work. You're going to see men who strive. You're going to see kids who overcome. Their names are not famous, but their virtues are. Hard work, sacrifice, desire for a better life for their kids. Those are the American people, and I'm very proud of them every single day, and I'm so honored to represent them in the United States Senate. So let me take your questions. You want to sit over here? You can ask me anything you want. I'm going to ask the first question. Except Stormy Daniels is <laughs> off the table. <laughs> I've never met her. I don't know her. <laughs> While my friends are thinking of questions, let me. Would you like to say anything else about Preston? Any more stories? Or oh, I've got plenty, but I think I'm probably. Preston, in, shall, shall, shall we in move enough, on, Mr. President? Actually, I'd like to pick up on something you mentioned a moment ago. Maybe that's part of this uh, point. But recently, I was looking at a, a poll, and as a Republican, uh, what do you make of this poll? That some skepticism on the part of um, the GOP towards higher education. This this uh, this is a Gallup survey said that Republicans in the U.S. have some to very little confidence in uh, college and universities, 67% um, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And the Pew Research Center showed that 58% of Republicans say colleges and universities have a negative effect on the way things are going in the country. Uh, what, what's your sense of that? And well, they, they didn't poll me. I can tell that. I, I, I don't see any of that in the United States Senate on either side of the aisle. In fact, I, um, I just I couldn't disagree more with that. Um, our challenge in education today is, uh, is not whether you should, you should further your education, and there are many ways to do it, um, but, but it's how to, we can help our colleges and universities remain solvent and yet deliver a price and a, that has value, but also that the consumers can't afford. Look, I mean, my, my dad, um, it's hard for me to imagine this, and maybe you, my dad was from a uh, depression family in Oklahoma. He left home when he was 14 years old. He, was, he went to the University of Oklahoma, came down here, met my mom, who was an LSU graduate. Um, I have three brothers, but when I, my uh, Members growing up were, it, it's not if you're going to college, it's where. I have two brothers who are physicians, one who is uh, uh, very successful political, in, uh, in very successful, uh, comp has a company in political advertising. But, um, you know, the, the future of this country lies in education. It, it's, it's education. It's not, it's not the unemployment rate. It's not the price of oil. It's not who the president is. It's education. And uh, um, it's just nothing more important. I'm just curious about those, those surveys. Um, I, but I don't see that in the Senate. I don't see that in the Congress. Uh, a, a topic that is talked a lot about in the Congress, and we've talked about it in legislative committees, is the, is the free exchange of ideas. How do you... How do you how do you, you uh, eliminate hate speech? And it's a very delicate balance, but at the same time, uh, make students understand that there are times when you hear ideas you disagree with that you're going to be uncomfortable. But you should, should listen. Doesn't mean you should change your mind, but on occasion you might. I've changed my vote on the, on the Senate floor uh, a couple of times after listening to the debate on the other side. What's an example? What, what, what's some policy that you found that after discussion and after learning more you thought would be a different? Uh, we, have a, we have a very controversial agency called uh, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, CFPB. And uh, the CFPB had a rule 
that was done under President Obama that, uh, that said, uh, if you're doing business with a company, I say you go get a credit card. And part of the user agreement is that you can't sue me in court. You can't fi join a class action. You can only do arbitration. The CFPB under President Obama said that's a bad rule. Well, President Trump is elected president, and he says, uh, I want to get... I want to get rid of that rule. I want, to, I want companies to be able to force consumers to go into arbitration and not join class actions. Uh, the Republican bish, uh, uh, position generally was um, to support President Trump. I listened to the arguments on, on both sides, and um, I think I was the only Republican who voted, voted against uh, the president on that bill. I just feel like... Uh, uh, our court system, where everybody has a fair shot, should be open to everybody. Good. Appreciate your open-mindedness and willingness to take um, another look at things like that. So it's a little hard to see, but I'm going to open this up for questions. And, uh, and um, please. Yes, thank you for coming oh. to Millsaps. I really appreciate you being here, Senator Kennedy. Thank you for um, having me. I wanted to touch more about uh, your discussion of debt in higher education. Many of our Millsaps graduates will graduate with a huge amount of debt and something that weighs on me as a professor who teaches here. Um, I know that this is a private institution even though it's a nonprofit, but I also know that um, higher education investing um, from the state, so let's say a state school, um, that funding has gone away mostly um, yeah. for, for public education. So even if a student wanted to go to Ole Miss, they would still end up graduating with a huge amount of debt. Um, what do you suggest as a solution to the huge amount of debt that people of my generation and younger are facing? Well, I'm willing to spend more federal money on it. Now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty conservative fiscally. I, I, I do believe in balanced budgets. I did vote against the last omnibus budget because uh, I was given a choice, um, the how, this way or the highway. I was told that... Uh, we, uh, we couldn't debate the budget, we couldn't offer amendments, that we had to pass it and borrow a trillion dollars in order to fund it. And I said, well, I'm not going to vote for that. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm uh, and I've driven all over Washington, D.C. I can't find the money tree. Uh, th this money's coming out of taxpayers, and, and, and a big chunk of it is debt. Having said that, I, I'm willing to spend the extra money on higher education, because I think it's worth it. I see the waste in government. Um, I mean, I don't, don't get me started. We're spending as best, we just finished an audit, we're spending between uh, 15 and 20 billion dollars a year in the federal bureaucracy by sending checks to dead people. I'm not making this up. Now, in Louisiana, dead people can vote, but cash and checks is a... <laughs> Is a, is a different story. We have agencies all throughout federal government that send out these checks, and about 15 to 20 billion of them, uh, are, we have found, are going to dead people, but they're being cashed. There's obviously fraud. You know why that's happening? It, because the Social Security Administration has a list of all the dead people in America. If you die this year, uh, you, a copy of your death certificate is going to go to the Social Security Administration. So they keep the master file. But the Social Security Administration will not share the, the master death file with other agencies. So I went to Social Security and said, why won't you talk to your sister agencies? Oh, we don't have the legal authority. So I'm introduced with Tom Carper, a, a, a Democratic friend. A bill I shouldn't have to. It's embarrassing to have to introduce the bill, but it's called the Stop Paying Dead People Act. <laughs> and 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 we're going to tell tell Social Security share the list. That's 15 to 20 billion dollars, and that's just a drop in the bucket. Um, I, I, if we can save a quarter of that, I'll spend every single penny on higher education. But we have the money to do it. We, 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 we just have to, to, to basically scrub the federal budget, and it can be done. What about the Pell Grant? Uh, do you see, what, what do you see as the future there? Uh, it, each year we hear um, some concerns about the possibility. I think it'll be okay, Rob. I mean, this, this is what happens in every Congress. 
Um, look, presidents have enormous power, but um, Madison was a genius, and he convinced his colleagues to set up these three branches of government. And under every president in, in, in modern history, presidents submit their executive budget to Congress, and Congress pretty much does exactly what he wants. Um, president Trump sent us a budget, I was talking with somebody earlier, uh, last year, that basically cut out most of the funding for the National Institutes of Health. And of course, it upset the National Institutes of Health. We told them, look, you know, chill. We kept all the funding. We, 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 we make our own decisions. Good. Other questions? Please. Well, there, there is some discussion of changing the Social Security system, uh, but, but, but really what I'm talking about is fraud. I'll give you an example. We just had an individual in Algiers, which is a, a suburb of New Orleans, who was just indicted. Uh, she had been cashing her mother's Social Security checks for about, uh, I don't know, 25 years, and mom died about 25 years ago. I mean, that's just fraud, pure and simple. Um, but but uh, because the Social Security Administration wasn't sharing that information with the agency sending the checks, it didn't know. Now, that's common sense to most people, most Americans, uh, but, but uh, uh, that happens in government. And, I mean, it's embarrassing to admit, but there, there is a lot of money. We are spending... Um, about $144 billion a year on what we call improper payments. Examples that I get, people getting tax refunds that aren't entitled to them, people getting earned income tax, uh, uh, refundable tax credits when they're not entitled. And it's just really a matter of checking. Good. Questions? Please. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> Putin did it. I, I've, been, I've seen the, the classified information. He did it. Uh, and, and he and other foreign agents are going to continue to do it. It's one of the things we talked about uh, with Mr. Zuckerberg at Facebook a couple weeks ago. Um, th this is my take on, on Mr. Putin, and then I'll talk about the Mueller investigation. Um, I mean no disrespect, but Mr. Putin is a thug. He is. I mean, I give you uh, Ukraine, Crimea, Syria, the poisoning in Great Britain. Um, you can't reason with him. Reasoning with him is like hand trying to hand feed a shark. He understands power. And he has to be checked. Uh, he did try to influence our election. I don't, I don't think he succeeded, 
I've got more confidence in the American people than that. But I don't know how you can tell what determines the outcome of an election anyway. People have a multitude of reasons for voting as they do. Uh, we, we, uh, we ask our Justice Department to investigate the allegations of Putin trying to interfere in our election. The Attorney General, as you know, recused himself. Rod Rosenstein is number two, uh, appointed uh, Mr. Mueller, uh, who happens to be a Republican, but he's pretty apolitical. He served with both Democrats and Republicans. I do not believe Mr. Mueller should be fired. I do not believe President Trump will fire Mr. Mueller for two reasons. Number one, I think uh, he's too smart to do it. He knows that uh, it could be the end of his presidency. Number three, I, and number two, I think he knows there would be an immediate and sharp reaction from Congress. Um, you have to watch what politicians do, not what they say. I mean, duh, I know that's not a real revelation, but, um, and that's true of presidents. I understand what, uh, I've been in, I don't know, 10 or 15 meetings with, with uh, President Trump. Uh, in every meeting, in some cases, one-on-one. -on -one. In every meeting I've been with him, um, he has a clean grasp of the issues. We have a rational discussion. I concede that something happens to him between midnight and 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't know what it is. He doesn't drink, so it can't be alcohol. I, I think he, the, the president, uh, he, he likes to manage out loud. And he grows anxious when he has an unexpressed thought. He just likes to say it. And, and that's his management style. And I know he's talked about Mr. Mueller. Um, I, I, I don't believe he'll fire him. And I'm not particularly worried about it. Now, and to answer your question about the bill, there is a bill uh, that's being offered to say he can't fire Mr. Mueller. I'm voting against that bill. I can tell you for two reasons. Number one, I'm not, I, I'm not convinced it's constitutional. If President Trump issued an executive order in the morning to the United States Senate and said, I'm mad at Kennedy, take him off the Appropriations Committee, we would ignore that executive order and it, it, it would be grossly unconstitutional. This is a case of, uh, of the United States Congress telling Mr., Mr. Trump who he can fire and who he can't fire. So I, I don't think it's constitutional, at least I think it's doubtful. But, but um, uh, number two, I just don't believe it'll happen, and it's going to precipitate a fight, uh, which is going to be a distraction. Now, if it happens, we'll deal with it, but I don't believe it'll happen. And, and if I can be brutally honest, our, 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 my Democratic friends want us to have that fight for political reasons. The midterm elections are coming up. And the more they can keep this stirred up, the better they think they can do on, in the midterm elections. So some of it is just raw gut politics. Speaking of those midterm elections, there are mm -hmm. quite a few Republicans that have said they're stepping down. Um, what's your take on that and your um, projections ahead? I, ours is a, uh, ours is, a, is, a, is, a is an angry country. And, and they're, they're a lot, people a lot smarter than me that tried to explain it. I can give you my take on it. And I have the advantage, Rob, of having run a campaign. So I've talked to a lot. Of, I dare say I've talked to shaking more hands than anybody in this room and really talked to people. Um, here's what I think the problem is in America. We have too many Americans who are not participating in the great wealth of this country. Not economically, not culturally, not spiritually. They just don't feel, they feel like America is leaving them behind. Now you can say, well, they have no reason to feel that way. You can't change feelings. Feelings are feelings. And, 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 and this is what elected Donald Trump president. I talk to, to middle-class Americans every day who say, Kennedy, here's the problem. We're going to lay it out for you because, you, you know, you're in Washington. Y'all are too stupid to figure it out yourself. So let me lay it out for you. Here's the problem in America today. We have too many undeserving. I want to emphasize undeserving so I don't paint with too broad a brush. We have too many undeserving people at the top getting bailouts 
getting special treatment, cutting corners. We have too many undeserving, not everybody, but too many undeserving at people at the bottom getting handouts. And we're in the middle. And we get stuck with the bill. And we can't pay it anymore. Because our health insurance has gone up. Our kids' tuition has gone up. Our taxes have gone up. But I'll tell you what hasn't gone up. Our income. And whether you agree with them or not, there are an enormous number of middle-class Americans who feel like they were promised hope and change and all they've gotten is decline and uncertainty. And they voted. And that anger is still out there. And I said throughout the campaign, this is going to sound strange, but the two candidates who were most alike in terms of their base were Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Their bases in that election were the only bases that were passionate. People would die for President Trump. People would die for Senator Sanders. They were angry. They wanted to change America. More of Senator Sanders' people thought that the problem was was the people at the top getting bailouts and special treatment. More of Mr. Trump supporters thought the people, the problem was the people, the undeserving people at the bottom getting the handouts. But they both represented middle class Americans. And I think that's the genesis of a lot of, of the anger. I think economics and improving the economy will help all of that. But it's not the only solution. The great strength of America today, America is not like it was in 1950, nor should it be, or 1970, or 1990. This is a big, wide, open, diverse country. And that's one of our strengths. But we've let that diversity become division. And we've got to talk to each other and, 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 and reacquaint ourselves with the things that we agree on, like, like freedom, like personal responsibility, like in our country, the, 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 uh, uh, the condition of your birth doesn't, doesn't determine the outcome of your life. If you work hard enough, you can, you can succeed. Um, now, sometimes Congress makes that harder. Sometimes President Trump makes that harder. He's an unconventional president. But uh, he's the president of the United States. And it's in my interest and your interest to make sure he succeeds. And that's what I feel about it. Boy, I talk too long. That's good. good. Other questions, please. I have, a, I have a question, and you don't talk too long. Where are you? Wave your hand. Oh, there you are. Yes, ma'am. You don't talk too long, and I agree. It's in our best interest as a country that he succeeds. I would like for you to put your law professor hat on. Looking at the history of our country objectively, mm -hmm. is a president ever above the law? And this no particular president in general? No. I believe in the rule of law. Um, that's why I don't think Mr. Mueller ought to be fired. I don't, I, 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 I don't think he's done anything to be fired. But I can tell you that... that um, look, cable news channels, they've got to make a living like everybody else. And to make a living, they've got to have people watch them. But the truth is, nobody knows what's going on in Mr. Mueller's investigation. Every, all the speculation, nobody really knows. Um, I've not met Mr. Mueller, but he's got a great reputation. Here's what I want him to do. I want him to finish his investigation. I wish he'd kind of go faster, but, you know, that's his call. I want him to finish this investigation. I want him to, to uh, get permission to talk to the American people. And so let me tell you what I found. And I, I'm going to give it to you, unvarnished and uncut. If somebody broke the law, they need to pay the price. But I want him to give all the facts to the American people. And I trust them to figure it out. Now, not every, every American has time to read Aristotle every day because they're too busy earning a living, getting up every day and going to work and obeying the law and paying their taxes. But they can figure it out and draw their own conclusions. 
That's what we need. And I think that's what will happen. I truly believe that. And all this other stuff about, well, what the president did and might do, and so-and-so wrote this book, and that's all tangential. What counts is what Mueller does. He will be allowed to finish and what the facts are, and we'll get them. But I can tell you part of what he's going to find, that, find already because I've seen the classified information. Putin did it. Now, you can debate whether he really influenced the election. I don't believe he did, but he sure as heck tried. Good. Question from a student, Bill. Uh, most of the countries of the world are taking steps to address the issue of climate change. Uh, -huh. Are Mm -hmm. And the Republican senators have more or less dropped the ball and let him get away with pulling us out of the Paris Climate Accord. Right. My question is, what would it take to persuade Republican senators to take climate change more seriously? Well, I, I don't agree with the premise of your question, that the Republican senators don't take it seriously. I think we, uh, I take it seriously. Well, I mean... Well, the problem with the climate change, the Paris Accord, everybody was in agreement we ought to clean up the environment. They just wanted the American taxpayer to pay for it. That was a problem. Um, and and uh, China, uh, under, under uh, President uh, Xi Jinping, has kind of come to the environmental concern party lately. But if you look at his record... Um, he's all for climate change as long as somebody else pays for it. Now, I'll admit, and I'm thankful for it, China's doing much better in terms of the environment. You know, you, you don't have to agree, to, to agree on the cause of climate change to accept the fact. In my state, for example, since we have been talking here today in my state, Louisiana, we've lost a football field of land. You know why? because the land's sinking and the water's rising. Now, I don't have to be a graduate of Millsaps to understand you're going to lose land when that happens. Now, you can debate all day the cause of it. Some say, well, when we levied the Mississippi River, the sediment couldn't, overflow, couldn't flow into the, and replenish the wetlands, and that's the cause. And others say, no, it's the oil and gas industry going in there and cutting canals. And others say, oh, the devil did it. I don't know. You can debate all day long the cause, but you, you, can, you, you can see the result, and that's what we're trying to do something about. I think uh, the world is. I think Republicans and Democrats are taking uh, uh, climate change very seriously. I think we will solve the problem in part through technology, through what's called geoengineering. We will figure out how to capture that carbon. We will, a lot of the carbon is, is as you know, in the ocean. We will figure out the minerals we can put in the ocean to absorb it. There, there are studies going on, funded with your tax dollars right now, about how we can, we can do what's called cloud whitening to reflect a lot of that sunlight. And I think we will solve a good bit of it through technology. I, I think also within, I don't know what period of time, but over some period of time, we will get away, we already are, from fossil fuels. But we can't run this country right now on solar power. We don't have the battery technology to store it. We can't run this country on wind power. Um, we've got a cleaner alternative than coal. It's called natural gas and, and, and oil. But I think, well, I won't see it in my lifetime, but uh, I think certainly in 100 years, we won't, maybe 50, maybe 30, we won't be nearly as dependent on fossil fuel. But I do disagree uh, with your premise that you know, Republicans don't care about the environment. I think, I think most Americans want clean air and bright water. I know I do. Well, going Scott Pruitt is in charge of the EPA, I think some of us will be skeptical about that. I understand. And, you, and this is America. You're entitled to, to believe that way. Right. One last question from a student. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, 
America needs a health care delivery system that looks like somebody designed it on purpose. Our problem is not quality of care. I'll put our docs and nurses and lab techs, nurse practitioners, I'll put them up against any in the world. If you get sick in India, you're coming to America if you have the money. Our problem is in delivering the care. And in, in delivery, there, there are two problems. Number one is cost. And the other is accessibility. I wanted the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, to work. Um, you will never hear me pre criticizing President Obama for trying it. His motives were pure. It wasn't a question of bad motives. It just turned out in retrospect to be a bad idea. I mean, it, it happens. Um, we were told it would make health insurance cheaper. It hasn't. It's gone up. We were told it would make it more accessible. It hasn't made it less. We, we just repeal the law that requires people to carry insurance. Otherwise, they have to pay a fine. I voted for that. Let me tell you why. Last year in my state, 138,000 people chose to pay the fine rather than buy the insurance, even though it was subsidized. 80% of those 138,000 people make $50,000 or less. 50% of those 138,000 people make $25,000 or less. So this was their choice. Either pay a fine or buy health insurance that is heavily subsidized, but they still can't afford it, and they chose to pay the fine. And the American people deserve better than that. Um, we can talk for hours. Eventually, we will address the problem. But I'm, I'm t this is my point of view. You, you can disagree if you want. Uh, the, the, the Affordable Care Act hadn't worked. We've got to try something else. We've got to. But I do know this. I won't, when moms and dads sit down at the, at the dinner table at night and talk about things, I want to be, I want to, I want them to talk, be talking about their children's future or their retirement. I don't want them to be talking about how to pay for the health care bill. Thank you. Afraid we're about out of time. You got um, one more here? Can I take him, Doc? Sure. <laughs> Well, what's the disaster? I'm sorry. I said, I'm not sure we would agree on why it was a disaster. I think it was a disaster because it wasn't a health care act. It was a insurance bill. Well, yeah. Because it was a real problem in this country is not insurance. It's the fact that the health care providers can rape the consumer. Can do what? I'm sorry. <clears throat> health care providers can rape the consumer. Yeah. Yeah, I bet you have. I've got a wife who's got some real problems. I've seen a lot of health care issues and how it's delivered and what they charge for. I've got friends that take the same drug my wife has to take. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Insurance. Mm -hmm. A drug that costs her 150 bucks a month out of pocket, 100 bucks a month out of pocket, costs a friend of ours over $1,000 a month out of pocket simply because Wow. When you endorse us too, if you have one of those things, and you include what the government pays and what you and I have to pay, it's close to twenty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, that's right. That's about right. We get good benefits for it. That's more than most people make that a lot of people earn. Yeah. The real problem and it's not Blue Cross's fault. They're they're negotiating great prices. The real problem is getting raped by the health care provider, the drug company. That's what I'd like to see change. What can you do about that?
Well, it's, 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 no, that's a great question. Look, it's not the amount of money we're spending. We spend about 70, 17, almost 18% of our gross domestic product on, uh, on health care. Um, the average uh, OECD country, developed wealthy country, spends about 9%. The amount we spend on health care is bigger than the economies of all but five countries. There's a, there, I'll leave you with this. There's an article in the New England Journal, I think it's New England Journal of, Med, of Medicine, uh, but it could be a different period. But the, 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 uh, some really smart people did a study uh, over a five-year period of the cost of health care in the OECD countries, the wealthier countries. America led most expensive. They blame it on two things. Pharmaceutical drug costs. Our cost per capita is about double what it is in other countries. In 2020, we will be spending, uh, federal government will be spending more on prescription drugs than on defense. So the first thing is prescription drugs. Second thing they say, say is the overhead, the administrative cost. And uh, the, they say if we can solve those two problems, and we can eventually, um, we can get the price down. Listen, this has been a real treat. Thank you. I'm impressed that the students came on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I, I, from that, I can assume that the parties haven't started yet. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. There's a reception afterwards. Um, please uh, join us there. And um, thank you for your service to our nation. And um, thank you.